Hi everyone, welcome to today's PTRC Fireside Chat. A quick introduction to us at PTRC. We are a training company based in the UK, which specializes in the training of transport planners, engineers, designers, and placemakers. We run a conference every year called the Transport Practitioners Meeting, which is happening this month. It's shaping up to be an amazing today's and I hope that you can join us. I'll put further information in the chat. PTRC is part of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, a membership organization for professionals leading the movement of goods and people. Glenn and I have had 16 fireside chats since April 2020, and I'm very excited for today's special um, event and our special guest. Um, I'll now hand it over to Glenn to kick us off. Sorry, Glenn, you're still on mute. <laughs> I was being so well behaved, Brogan, while you were talking. Uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yes, hi everyone. Welcome back to the PTRC Fast Eye Chat series uh, and our latest event. My name is Glenn Lyons and I'm the Mott McDonald Professor of Future Mobility at UWE Bristol in the UK. Thanks ever so much for joining us and I hope you'll enjoy the session. Please be sure as ever to get involved during the event yourselves by using the chat bar to raise issues and questions. It's not compulsory, but you may wish on this occasion to include an indication of your age when contributing. We consistently ensure gender balance on our fireside chat panels, of which I'm very proud, uh, in a professional world where all male panels or manals still linger, goodness knows why. But today, befitting the topic we will be exploring, we have also addressed diversity of age and life experience. And I don't want to sell short the many other attributes of our panel, that makes each of them unique and valued in today's discussion, but our interest is in teasing out intergenerational thinking on the future of transport. In the promotional text for this event, I included several quotes, uh, and I'll just come back to one of them here from Gloria Steinem, a journalist, political activist, and feminist organizer. She said, we need to remember across generations, there is as much to learn as there is to teach. I wonder if that quote resonates or jars with you, well, I hope, of course, it's the former. And to learn, we need to listen and reach beyond our egocentric thinking to truly benefit from how people at different life stages have experienced the world, perceive it at present, and anticipate what the future could or should have in store. I hope that after the next hour and a half, we're all going to be left with a strong reminder that intergenerational thinking and sharing of views is valuable to us all if our minds are open and receptive. Before we come to our wonderful panel here for you today, I want to introduce two other people to help us further extend the representation of age in addressing today's topic. If you look closely, you will see them behind me, Sarah Collings and Rosie Lyons. Firstly to Sarah, one of my colleagues at UWE Bristol's Centre for Transport and Society, who, together with my other colleague, Kieran Chatterjee, and in partnership with Sustrans, is leading a project called Transport to Thrive. The project's looking at the needs from the transport system of young people aged 16 to 24 as they move into adulthood. It engages directly with such young people. And what I have here are four insights from the project, finally provided to us from Sarah. First, adolescents and young adults have particular needs from a transport system. Two fifths of 16 to 24 year olds use buses frequently. Two thirds in this age group don't have a car. And from 16 to 24, a series of major changes in your life can take place, such as leaving education, starting employment and moving house. Transport can be a prominent consideration in these times of change. Second, the project's panel of young advisors emphasised the need to not forget the basics in addressing transport. In short, don't forget buses. 16 to 24 year olds want affordable and adequate bus services. They don't want more innovative transport topics getting in the way of that. Third, from the project's research interviewing of school leavers, it's become clear that there's a need for the transport sector to value and plan for the spectrum of journey types that young people want to make, if there's a serious wish to reduce the motivation for them moving into car ownership. Day-to-day -day journeys may not need a car, but without a wider view on needs, car dependence may still be inevitable. And finally, for many young people the project spoke to, the act of making journeys independently improved their confidence and life skills, 
Having the chance to make new and longer journeys improved self-esteem and expanded horizons. Transport plays a crucial role in supporting young people's personal growth during their transition to independence. We should be thinking about how a future transport system can recognise and support this. Well, I'll put contact details about the project in the write-up of this fireside chat. But next, to our youngest panel member, Rosie Lyons. Her clarity of thinking and ability to absorb and share knowledge blow me away. She's 11 years old. I wanted her to be with us today on the panel, and I think she was up for it. But rules are rules, and she had to be at school. So I decided to make her an honorary panel member. A bit like those important people who are too busy to join an event, but send a recorded message instead, I thought we could do the same with Rosie. So one recent school day morning at 7 a.m., when she was still half asleep on the sofa, I pounced on her with a question, which I said I would share the answer to with you here today. Rosie, what are your thoughts as someone aged 11 when you imagine the future of transport? Well, if you'll bear with me just for a moment, we can listen to what she had to say. I don't know. You think you're the spot. It's okay. Have um, a think. Like a good forty years time. Who knows? We might be on the verge of everything going away. The point where nothing would be here. Because of what we're doing now, we're affecting everybody else in the future. <coughs> we're you know, not worrying about it, but people in a good 50 years time, if there are going to be people in 50 years time, are going to be worrying about it then. They're going to be thinking if we had done, if they, people had done something before, then we might have actually had a chance to have a better Earth. And right now, transport, everyone's putting out these fumes from their cars, which equally means you're putting out fumes into the world. And then if we had a more sustainable way of transport, like biking, going on a train, we would equally have more years to live on the earth this amazing planet that humans can live on well um interested to know um what you made of that so uh, do please place your views in the chat bar in the audience if that prompted some thoughts in your minds so with the scene setting in place i'd now like to turn to our panel who I know from talking with them yesterday in advance, have many pearls of wisdom to share with us. So, Christine, over to you to begin with, please. Thanks, Glenn. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, really good to be here. I'm Christine Boston. I'm the director of Sustrans Cymru. So I'm responsible for um, strategy and operations for Sustrans in Wales. As the charity making it easier for everyone to walk, wheel and cycle, we deliver interventions in behaviour change, infrastructure, placemaking. Um, and as many of you will know, we are also the custodians of the National Cycle Network. The vision for Sustrans overall is for a society where the way we travel creates healthier places and happier lives for everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be on this panel today. Um, I bring a range of different perspectives to the discussion. Firstly, um, I would describe myself as a woman of midlife. Um, and I've got a range of my own experiences that I can bring to the discussion as a passionate advocate for active travel and sustainable uh, transport, and also equality and inclusion as well, with um, over a decade working on transport policy in Wales. Um, my focus is on the provision of services and facilities that allow all people, regardless of age, background, um, economic status, ability, um, allow all people to leave the car at home. Um, I'm also a carer for my son, who is four, 
and my mum who is 75 and living with dementia. If I think about my son's perspective and what he wants from the world um, and what I want for him as a mother, he wants safe places to travel on foot, bike or scooter. That is his joy. Um, he wants safe places to cross the road and to be you know, generally safe in the street. And that's about fewer cars, lower speeds, good driver behavior and so on. Um, and that really aligns with what we hear from children that we work with at Sustrans. Um, I was at an event recently in North Wales in a school and the children were clear and consistent. They wanted wider pavements, fewer cars, lower speeds and attractive safe places to be able to travel around their community. And I think it's worth reminding us all um, that active travel is a joyful experience. Um, traveling on foot and by bike um, is generally, you know, an experience um, that makes people feel alive, feel happy, feel connected. Um, I think it's fairly true for everybody and it's particularly true for the children. Um, they, when they're able to travel actively to school and they can feel safe doing so, it is a pure joy for them and also I think for those around them seeing that level of happiness. Um, when we ask the children how active travel makes them feel, happy is always the top response. Um, and they also remind us about the importance of togetherness and connection, which active travel provides. They talk about, you know, being out on their bike with their friend, walking to school with their friend, and um, that's something really important to them. So um, if I go to the other end of the spectrum and think about my mum's experience, um, I'm actually the former director of Community Transport Association in Wales, so that's entirely about accessible and inclusive transport. And I've heard so many heartbreaking stories about older people and people with disabilities who are isolated because they don't have access to transport. Um, they completely lose their independence. Um, as my mum was being assessed for her dementia, she was made aware that her driving license could be at risk. And she said to me, um, if they take my license off me, my life will be over. That is how she felt. And three weeks later, that is what happened. And it shouldn't matter, you know, as per Rosie's uh, points that, that she's made, you know, I, I talked to my mum about protecting the planet for her grandson. She doesn't go far. Um, we bought her a mobility scooter. You know, it shouldn't be a massive deal. But unfortunately, driving is so deeply embedded in our culture that it, you know, when the time comes that you're told you can't drive anymore, it is a very, very deep loss. Um, it is a feeling of loss, a feeling of hopelessness, a feeling of fear. And ultimately, it is, you know, a feeling of isolation that you can't actually, you know, go out, do the things you want to do, connect with um, friends and family. So I think we need to do a lot to improve services to make sure there are alternatives for people and that people can travel actively. Um, Sustrans has done some brilliant work recently. We did a disabled citizens inquiry, um, getting views you know, from people with disabilities, mobility problems on what it's like to get around in their community. Um, and so I think for me, in terms of intergenerational, it is about how, you know, as older age groups are choosing to travel to you know, create a better planet for the future. But I also think it's extremely important that we're thinking about planning for our own old age um, and making that a really positive experience as well. Thank you, Christine. That was a wonderful start for us from the panel. Um, and I think you really beautifully span the generations there from your son to your mum. Uh, it, it very much felt as though um, and maybe this is an exaggeration, but, uh, you know, our young people have happiness beaten out of them, or at least they're presented with a drug that seemingly makes them more happy, which is the drug of car dependence, only to discover that they're so desperately addicted that um, the very thing that they were seeking, which was independence and, and, and liberation, has been sort of snatched from them in, in the very sort of desperate case you outlined for your mum. So, yes, thanks for that, Christine. Wonderful start for us. Marcus, can we come across to you? And perhaps you could remind us, since we've just jumped to the other side of the globe, um, what time it is over there. Um, it's currently 9.45 in the evening. And I've got to start by acknowledging that my age is 81 and that I'm a long period away from my retirement, which was in 2007. 
I've spent a lot of time since then in a range of academic appointments and a few extra degrees and publications in a considerably wider range of fields. So I represent the elders that you only don't hear about, uh, the non-stereotype ones. But these fields are outside transport in most cases, and it gives me a different point of view and has expanded my understanding. Of course, I could replicate some of the things that Christine's saying, but I think that would be a waste of the opportunity to look a little backwards and then a little forwards. I make no claims to be fully up to date in any of the fields I work in, including transport, but I've kept reasonably in touch, I think. Over half a century in transport has let me engage in the developments in modeling, analytical methods, intelligent transport systems, data, moving from very scarce to overload, to the slow recognition that freight systems and logistics are critical element in transport and well beyond their regulation just in road carrying, to considerations of gender and age from children to elders. And all of this has happened during my period working in the profession. I've actually tried to push some of it. I've seen one discipline after another become valued and applied in transport applications, although the full take up into application has generally been a matter of decades. Some of them, just as an example, and there are many, is environmental impact. Understandings of the importance of air pollution, severance, noise, and the development of choice and agent-based models into actual use. Many of these were put forward a long time ago and took a long time to be picked up. The point I'm going to emphasize several times is the rate of change in the profession, how it works, with whom, how it looks, and what its projection is, is too slow. We need to be more adaptable, use our tools to help us, but in particular, make certain that we look more broadly. I have to emphasize that some of the papers, or most of them that underpin these developments are over 40 years old, one's over 50, yet all are currently cited. This does suggest that transport profession is a little lethargic in taking up the issues as they arise. What's not developed positively is transparency and genuine community engagement to match the rapid rises in education and sophistication of the wider community and the co-design gains that can be realized. I've seen this by one example in my involvement in the Portland and Oregon data and modeling developments, where open sourcing secured such high levels of political interest and some real changes that when I suggested we have a meeting with the politicians, even the director of the project couldn't get in the door. It was really quite a revelation to see the actual engagement that was achieved by that open approach. I have to also point out that the fast expansion of data, most of the people here would not remember a time when data was extremely difficult to get and very expensive and had to be really worked over to understand. Let's look forward for a minute. My great frustration at the moment, looking forward, is that digital twins are not being used universally. We have data everywhere. We have satellite data, we have direct LIDAR, we have all of the pickups, we actually have cars picking up information. It's littered everywhere. But if you go out, you talk to a local council, they're not using digital twins. Why? Because the conception, the communication has not been done by our profession. We need to do it. That's just one area. But think about it. Digital twins actually allow real participation and real consultation and engagement, which can move the current model of customer engagement, i.e. trying to persuade people what you've already decided is what they really want, into some form of consultation, perhaps, perhaps even co-design. Goodness me, one might have to recognize there are a few people in the community at least as expert as we are and very active. Big data has also got a price 
And in the, the last 30 years, it has moved from being, thank God we can get it, to my God, it's surveying us. There is a median path. We haven't yet re really found it. But when you realize just how much we have and how poorly we bring it together, then we have great opportunities, not just to do things better, but to be able to adapt to change more quickly. That is a point that after many years in transport, I am frustrated by again, the slow rates of change. Insurance systems are beginning to pick it up, of course, and some road condition work. At a strategic level, this huge volume of economically secured real-time monitoring data can change road management and maintenance methods and policies substantially. Consider if we had really good monitoring information brought together, which is perfectly practicable now if we wish to do it, then we can extend road management and transport management in a continuing basis, adapting to what's going on, projecting to a short term in the, in the future, and change the balance between strategic policy and short term policy so that we actually get a better adaptation rate. Optimal control methods are used for this in other domains and allow us to determine which buttons to push or which buttons to turn to actually move in the right direction. This kind of thinking has not yet reached transport. It reached economics with Arrow back in the 80s, 1980s, just to remind you. So we're no longer talking about a sporadic basis. We're talking about a continuing basis. This fits in very well with monitoring and management tools and current methods. They're just two wide open opportunities which haven't been picked up as yet. Conceptually, they're very useful. Bringing them into practice is a little harder, and in fact, a lot harder. Motorway management systems, however, how picking up most of it. We could do that more broadly if we were to take data seriously, and we could respond better. The planning area must become more aware and responsive to the widely differing behaviors of different age, gender, and indeed cultural groups in their use of locational opportunities. I haven't seen signs that they've really been picked up as yet. COVID's made it quite clear that quite radical changes are perfectly possible and can have real effects, but not all are positive always, on the ways and locations in which the activities that transport services are delivered. And at long last, micro mobility and automated driving or close to it, it's close to arriving, but not yet properly thought through as it needs to be. One area which I would take back to Christine is I have personally changed my vehicles in order to get the full benefits of detection, 360 detection, a automatic braking, etc. I'm just about to get a Tesla where in fact I will in a year or two's time go for automated driving in order to extend my capacity to drive safely, and I hope the regulatory system will respond to it. I've carefully avoided some of the more broad and grandiose commentaries about the future. I'm concentrating on the methods by which we can adapt, respond more quickly, and move in the directions that we need to go with better understanding and better information. I hope I've touched on those elements that would allow us to do it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, and you know, a very strong reminder there. Well, what encouragement perhaps that the transport profession has been progressively enriched by the growing number of different disciplines and therefore perspectives. But underlining that uh, is this sense of frustration that um, it, it's moving too slowly. Uh, in a sense, we have perennial problems that you recognize today that perhaps you recognized many years ago. Uh, and when you say too slow, my inclination was to then ask myself, does too slow mean too late? Um, and 
uh, Merlin in the in the audience indeed asks, you know, how do we speed it up if it is too slow? So my my quick two questions to you, if you can give a very succinct response, is why do you think the profession moves so slowly, and is there any hope of speeding it up? And then we'll move on to Janice. The signs are there, and I'll cover them in a little later contribution. But working with other disciplines changes perspectives and it expands what you look at. All I'm saying is we now have the tools to our hands to get that information and to be able to look at it from different ways. Those are the essential elements to be able to change. Politics will always make it slower. But if we have the tools, we can be more coherent and make our cases better. That would be, I think, my first answer. OK, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reassured uh, that politics will always make it slower. Um, but let's let's move to Janice, who I think it's safe to say doesn't have half a century of transport profession experience under her belt just yet. But um, Janice, over to you. Looking forward to hearing from you. All. <laughs> yes, definitely not. Definitely not that much. Um, yeah, I'm Janice. I'm a transport planner. Um, so I'm part of the future mobility team at Mott McDonald. Um, so I uh, get to work quite closely with Glenn. Uh, my role mainly consists of applying different futures tools and techniques we have in house to kind of help transport authorities um, come up with these really robust visions, um, strategies, um, taking into account different you know, uncertainties we have in the future. Um, I'm re relatively new to this role. Prior to this, I was in the UAE, um, worked more on the technical side of things. So it was more uh, intelligent transport systems, um, traffic signal design, smart mobility type of projects. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be part of the panel. And um, I think I'd like to split my intro into three themes and I was able to rhyme them. So quite proud of that. Um, it's burn, concern and learn. So Burn, why am I in this role and what's really keeping me going? Um, there's this quote uh, that I read recently that really resonated with me. Um, it's by this philosopher uh, called Simone Weil. So she says, uh, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. Um, it's just this idea of what it means to be rooted, uprooted. Uh, most of the time we think of oh, someone is uprooted if you have a country that's just trying to impose their culture on them or call, trying to colonize them. But she talks about someone is uprooted if just they're not able to you know, take part in the society. That itself is someone not being um, uh, someone being uprooted. So I feel that that's very relevant to us as transport professionals because um, if we are able to play that role in someone's life or if someone needs to access education, employment, um, different services um, and take part of that society, we should be able to do that um, so that no one's excluded in any way. Um, so I feel like that's something that's motivating me in this role. And then um, second concern, um, um, this is something that I had prepared before, but then I was very shocked to see that one of the findings, Glenn, that you uh, picked up from the study is very similar to what um, I wanted to say. So it's good confirmation. So I think in the few years of experience that I have had, one thing that I've noticed is we can be, we can, we tend to be distracted you know so if something is new and exciting that comes along we're always wanting to join the hype um, our generation calls it the formal fear of missing out um, so was, at one point it was mass evs avs um, we're always wanting to join the bandwagon and then currently there's a, so much fervor around evs and wanting to install all of these charge points. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, how would it look like if we had the same fervor uh, to put in simple things like bus lanes or bus priority measures, you know, what would a national bus priority strategy look like? Um, so yeah, just like you said, makes me wonder uh, if we are really forgetting like the boring basics. Um, and I feel like it's very much needed now, especially with 15% of the buses that potentially could be scrapped if uh, we don't get funding from the government. Um, and then also we're not able to reach 
bus patronage, we're still not able to reach pre-pandemic level. So I feel like moving forward um, is, is making sure that we don't lose that focus on the basics. Um, and then learn something that I want to be asking, I don't want to say the older, but definitely wiser uh, generations. It's, it's just, you know, what is it that my generation should be doing differently? Because um, um, something that I'm starting to see is, I feel like all of us, we know what needs to be done, more or less. We're kind of on the same page, councils um, or consultants, um, we know what needs to be done. It's, but it's these bureaucracies and red tape that comes with different processes uh, that kind of slows us down and is kind of standing in the way of real change happening. Uh, and sometimes in my role, it can be quite frustrating. Um, sometimes I wonder, am I really able to make an impact um, it can feel quite helpless. So yeah, curious of what the panel thinks. Yeah, and that's it for me. That, that was wonderful. Um, and I get a sense that you can still resonate with Christine's four-year-old son in the sense <laughs> some of the things you hold precious uh, and also very nicely underlining that, you know, boring, which is actually another, pedestrian is another word for boring, doesn't actually mean it's not important and a, and a pathway to happiness. Uh, and yes, it does seem that we have a rather dangerous bandwagon effect that often seduces and distracts us. Um, and perhaps it brings us back to the political dimension again, that uh, it's very hard to celebrate boring and win votes, but perhaps it shouldn't be. Um, look forward to some re reactions from other members of the panel later on that. Um, Jenny, glad to see you back with us. I know you're you're struggling. We've obviously taking advantage of the technology that wasn't there 50 years ago, but it's uh, it's still quite can't quite stand up to everything we put it under strain with. Um, but let's move now to Emmanuel. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's nice to listen to the different generations. Uh, thank you for sharing Rosie's comment as well. I think it's it's nice to have that was quite emotional. Like yes, you could feel you could feel that in her in her voice. So um, my Emmanuel Mogadji, I'm an academic researcher with interest in transport services. So I guess often I would like to sort of present my background so that that can really uh, make the listeners understand the perspective in which I'm coming from. So today's presentation is actually around uh, transportation and generation. So linking those two together. But I think for me, it's also recognizing some other intersections that are connected within that line. So for me, it's about uh, the background. So where, where, I've come, where I've come from and how that might have affected my, my interest or my, my engagement with transport and also perhaps my role so uh, my role, let's start with family. So uh, I think I, I, I will also describe myself as a middle-aged man. Yes, I've got children. Uh, youngest is five and the oldest is eight. And they cycle to school. Yes, provided it's the weather is safe or the weather is good and the road. And for them, it's, it's something they enjoy. It's something they look forward to. So I think that's, that's something I would like to bring uh, in terms of my, my background. And also I work at the university and I'm able to also engage with uh, millennials, young people, and who sometimes will be driving to campus, sometimes will be walking and uh, just trying to really understand uh, the role of cycling on campus. So that's something I'm just reflecting there. I think listening to the first uh, presentation, the first uh, point about uh, cycling and to actually see how individuals can take up cycling, but recognizing uh, perhaps maybe a safe environment for, for, for it on campus. Because I think that's what many of those young people would think about saying, I don't feel cycling in the city. But how about cycling on campus? Is that something that could be explored? So I guess that's something to, to, to share with the team. And also when I talk about my background, I'm originally from Nigeria. And I can, I can say in Nigeria, I only took train once because for them, uh, it's not something that is very popular. It's not something that is very common. It's, it's just different. And I'm sure that is same for many people of my generation compared to now when the government in Lagos State is investing money in building new set of train. And you can see a whole generation who might have gone without using train as a mode of public transportation. 
and you have the younger ones now going on train and you see this sort of excitement. And this is something I always try to, to balance up. Like in the UK, people might feel it like, yes, it's normal for you to go on train. But when you see people getting excited, taking pictures, like being on a train, like, come on, is this not the normal train I used to take? And yes. So I guess for me, while thinking about the generation and transportation, I have this lens in which I try to view things, uh, perhaps coming from developing countries and to see that, yes, we want to have a bigger picture of what uh, transportation is about and how that can change as it, uh, in terms of generation. So going back, uh, I think it's about recognizing the need of each of those generations from the children, uh, from university students, from those who are working and even uh, the aged parent. But ultimately to have that underlying support in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, of policy, and even the public attitude towards a uh, sustainable mode of transportation. There was a journal article that came out which talks about people's attitude to cyclists wearing helmets. And again, this is where you recognize that there are some uh, negative perception, let me just some perception about active mobility and even irrespective of the generation. And I guess that is something to, to explore. So as I finish uh, my introduction, uh, I go back to my role as an academic researcher. And this is where I try to balance my academic interests with my own like personal interests. So I'm not a transport planner. I work in a business school. So I see transport as a service. And if it's a service, you want to understand the need of your consumers. So think about marketing, your segmentation, your positioning and your targeting. Who are your consumers? How do I target? 16 to 24 to cycle, would I, would I approach it different if I'm targeting 60 to 65? So as a marketer, I'm trying to really say, how do I sell this transport as a service for people to, to enjoy? So thank you so much for this time. It's a pleasure to be back and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Manuel. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, and I think you also left me thinking or wondering how much your perspective has changed, not only as you have grown older and moved through your life stages, but also moved continents. Um, do, do you have a sense that the Emmanuel of today would have similar views to the Emmanuel of 10 years ago? No, no, because I, that's why I want to sort of recognize my privilege. And that is also something that has influenced my research and also taking responsibility saying, what could I have done differently? But perhaps linking to what Rosie was saying, in 50 years time, so this is like, okay, minus 10, I can't change that. But going forward, what will I, what will I have contributed to the way things are being done in my own home country? So uh, in manner of 10 years, uh, yes, that's, that's somebody who just wants to, you know, or just move from A to B. But now I think it's about being conscious about the decisions I make being conscious about how I even sort of engage with my children, putting them on a bicycle saying, guys, let's cycle today. Don't let us take cars. And also saying, is this a trend I would like to continue? Great, thanks, Manuel. Now, last but not least, uh, and Jenny, lovely to have you back. Um, let's hand over to you for your opening remarks, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. I, I'm very excited and very uh, honored to, to be here. Um, that's why I'm persevering despite all my technical challenges. I'm, I'm actually at a trade show, but I'm doing this as well. I, I found a, a deserted mezzanine to sit on now and uh, uh, very oppositely, actually. Uh, there was no one else here when I first came up the stairs. Uh, now I've been joined by what I would guess are probably four apprentices who've been sent here to a trade show looking at their age and their appearance. Uh, an excellent example of the younger generation being sent out here to mingle with us, us older ones. So that's great. So I'm Jenny Martin. Uh, I think I'm attending today mainly as an international vice president of the CALT. I'm one of those annoying semi-retired people who appears on every board that will have them. Uh, I strongly uh, Council Christine to make sure that you shut all the doors or I'll appear on the sustenance board before too long. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very, find it very hard to, to turn down any invitation to do that sort of voluntary work. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, very briefly, CLT International, we are obviously very, very closely entwined with CLT UK, run by Sharon Kindersides, but we are not them. 
what we do is we license branches of CLT around the world to uh, carry out uh, training and education uh, accredited. You know, people do get certificates when they've done the training. Uh, I'm fairly new to it, but really enjoying it. It's stretching me into an area where I've not worked before. So finding it very interesting. And I'm also uh, all about So brutal intervention uh, of technology in the mezzanine, I suspect. Uh, let's yeah. hope. <laughs> oh, Jenny, you're back. Carry on. Back to you straight away. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'll persevere and see what happens. The. Um, sorry, I lost my head now. Yes, it, it's about proper collaboration where people, wherever they are in the world, listen to each other and learn from from one another. I'm I'm very keen on that. Um, it's interesting what's been said so far about the, the car-centric uh, society that we built for ourselves, uh, particularly here in the Northern Hemisphere, going back to what I said before. I live in an estate which was drawn up at a time when it wasn't envisaged that anybody living on that estate would own a car. And it is, we're, we're a true 15 minute city. Everything we need apart from our workplaces are within 15 minutes walk of, of our dwellings. And in the olden days when the estate was first built, so would the workplaces have been, though London has changed since then. Of course, the trouble is that we are part of London and we're also, because we're what's known as Metropolitan Essex, we're one of the boroughs out to the east of London. We're also part of Essex and people do work for, further away and we can't escape the car-centric society that we've ended up in with horrendous consequences for the streetscape uh, because there is no off street parking pavement parking is absolutely rife road safety isn't good because of that and we we have an absolute plague of illegal e-scooters again if you drill down people aren't they're not using them illegally because they want to break the law they use them illegally because they those these e-scooters are a really good travel option for them it just happens that nobody got round to regulating and legislating in time it's just run away from us so that's a little bit about where I live, which I, I think is you know, relevant to this, this discussion. Uh, when it comes to age, I don't really know what I am. Uh, I consider my middle age to have stopped when I turned 60, though many of my English female, British female friends get quite cross when I say that, which segues into the fact that as a woman, age... Oh gosh, that's a shame, Jenny. We'll have you back in a moment, I'm sure. Um, perhaps just while yeah. we're waiting. Carry on, Jenny, sorry. Yeah, uh, when, when you're in your early 60s like I am, uh, it's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to fight it and you're supposed to deny that it's even going on. So that, that's a very interesting experience and I think relevant to the intergenerational discussions that we're having. I, I'm very pleased to, to see that when, when I've started working, and I've always worked in, in this country, so these are British workplaces, um, there was an absolute culture of deference whereby if you were younger, you defer to the older. And that was nothing to do with uh, seniority in the workplace or qualifications or education or anything. It was just if you were 25, you defer to anyone who was 50. And that's how it was. And certainly anybody who was 50 would have been very unlikely to listen to anybody in their 20s. And that's all changed. And I think that's a real positive for what we're talking about today. It's far more open now to people learning from one another because it's far more acceptable that you can listen across the generations and you can learn across the generations in all the different directions. And I think my, my final point moving on from that would be that the the what we need to do in transport now in order to have the, the livable society that Rosie wants for 50 years time, it, it, it need, we need to build on that because the younger transport professionals ha probably have, no, I'm sure they have really good visions about where they want to be in 50 years time when they're 70 in the in the 70s or even 80s. What they don't have is what my generation and Marcus who's disappeared completely, not just frozen like me. Uh, what we have is we have roots back to when people did live car free, because that's what everybody did. Uh, all my four grandparents, I knew all of them, uh, were in, you know, in, in the non-value use of the word peasant.
I know as soon as I start talking, Jenny will come back. Um, but possibly this time the Wi-Fi has got the better of her. Um, let's see. Um, I hope she doesn't mind in her absence. When we had a conversation yesterday as a panel, um, one of the comments that Jenny made, and I may paraphrase incorrectly, is that she can recall being Rosie's age when she was petrified of nuclear holocaust, not a climate emergency. Um, and, and I'd be really interested as and when Jenny comes back to get a sense from the panel, or if Jenny doesn't come back anyway, get a sense from you about whether that is a, an, a, a realistic analogy to draw or whether the two things are so fundamentally different. Because I think that could be quite powerful for the younger generations of today to have some signals of optimism from the older generations who also have lived through times of fear and anxiety. Um, I don't know if any of you on the panel have a reaction to that observation from Jenny. No takers straight away. Um, what I am interested in is having listened to you all uh, is, I mean, I find it so energizing to have this type of panel gathered together. Um, it can You can never have enough diversity, I suppose, but we seem to have such a richness of perspectives. And I just wonder whether you sense this, this gathering is distinctly different or you encounter this type of rich mixture um, of, of different intersectional characteristics elsewhere or have experienced it elsewhere in your professions, in your professional lives. Marcus. I've seen it from a different angle. Uh, one of the things I love doing is mentoring totally different discipline groups so they can actually work together. <laughs> And this is where this type of energy tends to emerge, even if there's a wide range of ages, genders, whatever. Um, it's really stimulating to see how if you get a group of people who want to know how best to work across their disciplines, it takes a while, but the energy appears. It often appears from people who are initially disengaged. So that's one small positive point that I can toss in, which I think supports many of the things that have been said in order to pick up and gain some understanding or at least some mutual energy from the different groups. And, and what we've heard from everyone is, um, in one sense, you could say, well, it, it shouldn't be rocket science, um, but probably it's more complicated than that, uh, insofar as we're reminded of just how diverse the population is and indeed how our own lives as we go through a life course can change in terms of the experiences and circumstances we face um but that does that mean we move to a position where we look to the future where it's very difficult to please all the people all of the time or perhaps i'll look towards you christine to start with you know does design for all provide the magic solution here that can offer up mobility options that benefit everyone or are we a little bit hamstrung in the sense that there are many different needs and then those who are able to shout loudest to have the greatest agency put their needs before others yeah i think that um you know we don't have a very representative transport sector do we really um so i am constantly calling for greater diversity um, and inclusion in the workforce so you know we're more representative we've got a better understanding of the communities that we're looking to serve um and i think as well that we need to be making sure you know as marcus mentioned before looking at the co-design approach making sure we're engaging with communities we're involving communities in transport design and decision making um so that we know we are developing a service that will actually deliver for them um and i think you know there are you know, there are lots of things that we know. We know we don't have an inclusive service. We know we don't have an inclusive workforce. Um, and, you know, we need to be doing more about that. There's plenty of evidence. You know, we need to um, stop, you know, 
Um, I don't not stop doing the research, carry on doing the research, but let's apply the research that we have. We have a lot of knowledge. Um, let's utilize that and work with communities to develop solutions that are actually going to meet their needs. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts from others on this this matter? You know, does it make it even harder to provide a future for everyone given the diversity we have? Emmanuel? Uh, yes, uh, I'm just trying to share my own experience uh, working in a university because I'm able to meet different generations. And so far, I think it's about the awareness about what is available. So I think there is that growing concern about uh, sustainability, about uh, protecting the environment. But I must say, it's, it seems to focus more around fashion not more on transportation. So I'm just thinking perhaps if students can start, so this is where you see students doing dissertation, they try to do sustainability fast fashion, but I don't think many of them actually think about transportation in terms of sust as in, uh, connecting sustainability with transportation. They often seem to focus it on fashion. Well, well, that is understandable. That is what they can relate with. But I'm just trying to have this this idea about here, yeah, this is something that students of it, as in just trying to understand that small generation in between those spectrum scene, perhaps if they increase their own awareness, education about these things, so that can also inf inf influence their change in behavior. So where you see people now saying, you know what, I'm not buying this dress because I don't need it, because they are now aware of the implication of that. Could they start thinking, you know what, I don't think I need to buy a car. Yes, even though I need to start doing my driver's test or those, no, I'm not buying a car. I want to start cycling. So how do we change that whole idea? Well, okay, while you are doing, while you recognize about fashion, about food, I think you could also be exploring transportation. So that's just my own thought around that. Thanks, Emmanuel. And, and again, a reminder for me that uh, it's, it's about who you give the microphone to and who, who has an amplification of their views and, and values that starts to influence others. And maybe this, um, we've had a comment in the audience, which is um, about intergenerational inequality, but actually not uh, in, in that necessarily the relation to agency as such, but um, wealth inequalities. Um, uh, interestingly, Martin, uh, Marcus, you mentioned buying your new Tesla. Um, I know I don't have the resources or intention of buying a new car of any sort. Um, I wonder if others on the panel would, or perhaps moving to Emmanuel, Christine and Janice, whether you know you have your eyes on buying a new Tesla sometime soon. But is, is there, do you sense any of you that this point raised by, and, and I don't know who Santiago Snapper is, but uh, in the audience, um, that intergenerational wealth inequality is really coming home now as an important issue. Marcus. I, think I think it is because it's reducing choices. Um, but there's an interesting counterbalance. The younger generation, and I mean up to 15, uh, you were talking about from 16, Christine. Um, I've talked to a lot of them. I really like dealing with, with, with kids. And they are deluged in so much information and so much commentary that the bullshit, fact, bullshit detectors are becoming quite good. And the other thing is they're also able to filter it reasonably well. And I mean a significant fraction of them, not everybody. I went to the climate change marches, for well, two of them, one in New Zealand and one here. And in both cases, I talked to people who are clearly not 15, who'd actually read the IPCC reports or part of them, and they had coherent views and they could see how it was going to affect them. Now, I don't think this is becoming unusual. And I think that we should, and I've actually been considering campaigning for a younger age of voting because agency is removed from the old and agency is not given to the young. And I think in both ends, we need to expand it a bit to make these things work. Um, I, I think just... the points need to be added to who are we catering for? Yeah, and, and I want to take, I'll maybe um, use the phrase you had yesterday instead of the uh, the BS detector, um, but you, you very nicely talked about nonsense filters 
of the young. Um, Janice, if I can put you in that category, do you do you sense you have a good nonsense filter? And if if so, how much nonsense are you putting up with at the start of your career from others around you? Um, nonsense. <laughs> um, I think in terms of yeah, the transport profession. I think it can be easy, at least as consultants, it can be easy when you're working with different councils and um, it's easy for us to put up these different targets um, and all of these, you know, things that we want to put in just because we have to. Um, and so it can be quite a challenge um, in terms of, okay, in terms of implementation, how is that going to look like? Uh, okay, it's it's all well and good to say one thing, but you know, uh, when it comes down to actually implementing it, uh, implementing it, or in terms of behavior change, how are we going to see that? So yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> in those respects, definitely. The policy action gap irritates you as perhaps it does many others of us. Um, yeah you're led to believe the targets were actually intending to be met or have a credible yeah. chance of being met. Um, Jenny, let's let's move to you while we have you. Uh, I love the fact, well, uh, you won't be enjoying it yourself, I know, but you mentioned yesterday you were a citizen of nowhere and it, it looks as though they're kicking you all around this conference, <laughs> making you feel that way. Um, just just before we when well, we lost you earlier, I took the liberty of mentioning your comment yesterday about how when you'd been Rosie's age, um, you'd been petrified about nuclear holocaust um, and perhaps the suggestion that that might offer some some solace to the younger generations of today who are now experiencing their own anxieties, not that it's confined to younger generations. Would you be willing to just elaborate a bit on that and what you're making of? looking forwards now for both transport and society in the face of the climate emergency. Thank you. Can I, can I just check, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, because I'm, I'm on my phone now without benefit of any headphones or anything. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, because we, the conversations about the, the anxieties and the fears of, of really quite young children around climate change. I, I suppose my compatriot, uh, Greta Thunberg, was the, the start of all this because, because she was so young herself when she came on the world stage. Uh, I guess her views and her pronouncements resonated more with, with the children because she was more or less a child herself. And I don't know why it's taken me until now because Greta must by now be 20, I guess, to realise that this really echoes with me because when I was a, a child in, in the 60s, uh, my parents had a very real fear of nuclear annihilation uh, to do with the Cold War, and which very much permeated down to us children, as these things always do, even if the parents do try to hide it, which I don't think mine particularly did. But it, the children do catch this sort of thing. And perhaps it's worse for children because it's harder for them to they don't have the frame of reference. I think that's me. Now, because I lived through the fear of uh, the Cold War, and here I still am, uh, the fear of climate change, my attitude is more than more that, that we can do something about this. Uh, there's no need to be paralysed. There's no need to you know, blow all your money on excellent champagne or whatever. Uh, if, we, if we have the will, then we have the means to, to do something about this. It's not to minimise the mental health impact on children. But I think, I mean, I'm, my, my, my academic uh, work, such as it is, is in history. And I think this is why history is so important. And that's what, before I was thrown out the last time, what, what I was getting at was that it is actually important what happened 60, 70 years ago when my grandparents were young adults in order to inform what we do, what we do for the future. You know, the famous trite saying, is that if you don't know your history you will repeat all of its mistakes in an endless loop yes thanks jenny yeah i think very interesting prospect perspective there for us to reflect on afterwards um, what i'd like to do uh, as many in the audience will know we we teed up a set of questions to whet people's appetites to join today's conversation um, if I could ask for a fairly rapid fire round the panel, I know each of you have been chewing over these questions. Um, Janice, could I start with you? Was there a question that caught your attention and what did you have to say about it? Um, yeah, I think it's 
what I'm hopeful and fearful of, of the future of transport. Um, I think in terms of hopeful, I think I'm definitely hopeful that change is possible. Um, we might not be exactly on track where we want to be, but at least seeing the progress we have been able to make, um, uh, and also especially in terms of uh, climate change, um, you know, just setting up the targets in self in comparison to the other countries where I, f I feel like we might be at a better place. So uh, optimistic in that sense. Um, but at the same time, there's a flip side of change where I feel like um, so far, it, it's almost as if we've had to been pushed to these extreme situations for us to really um, have any sort of change happen. So an uh, example would be the cost of living crisis. Um, that's kind of what pushed the government to put this caps on bus fares or even COVID, like Marcus said, overnight we were so easily able to repurpose road space. So it's kind of us having these extreme situations happen to us for us to really think, okay, we need to do something different now. Um, and so that kind of worries me in a sense that what's the next extreme situation that's gonna happen for us to think, um, okay, let's change our um, MO. Um, and, and that's just not in terms of government or policy, but also I think individually um, uh, us changing our behaviors um, as well. I think the second one, I would say in terms of fearful, I'd say um, maybe not, might not be such a popular opinion, but I feel like because climate change is now such a popular topic and rightly so, um, it's taken the front seat, but in doing so, maybe I fear that social inclusion might take a backseat because, you know, the route to decarbonization, it can be quite expensive and it may not be something that everybody is able to afford. Um, and so I fear that there's a gap that might widen even more between people who are able to afford a certain lifestyle, people who are not. Um, and so how are we able to kind of ensure that just transition? Um, yeah, I think those are my two <laughs> takeaways in terms of, yeah. No, I'm very taken by that. And it, kind of imagining this image of these, these successive shocks that we're having in order to, to bring about behavior change in, in a more substantive way and um, trying to resist going to the sort of defibrillator mode, but it seems as though we're, we're trying to shock a failing system back into a different form of life. Um, and each shock gives a sense of some change happening and then it subsides again and we, we're waiting for the next one. Um, and yet maybe if we switch that analogy um, with a, enough successive shocks, there is a grand swell building up of the sort of the ingredients and dynamics of a more fundamental change happening over the years and decades ahead um, for us. Um, thanks for that. Emmanuel, what took, caught your attention from the questions that we had before? Uh, I think Janice, uh, Janice's question also uh, aligns with my interest, which is the future of, of transportation. So I was thinking about, I uh, think the whole idea of this buzzword, everything is coming and we just want to jump on it while it's fresh. And it reminds me of how COVID really changed transportation. Like, yes, boom, it just came and everything done. And I'm now thinking about metaverse. So that's something I'm like interested in because it's not another big buzzword. And to see, okay, would transport change? Would metaverse come and change transportation? So uh, because in games you can teleport and just go from different places. You don't need to really go on anything. You can fly and yes. So I'm, I don't, I think that is a mission impossible. I think it can be, but who knows? Do we think we can start looking and start engaging in virtual world so I won't have to travel my avatar, we actually be in the metaverse and be doing those things. And the data you want, you can collect it from the metaverse. All those things can be happening in meta, I don't know, but that is just something I'm just trying like, yes, with this metaverse and even Apple launching their own VR headset, Facebook, everybody just pushing metaverse into our, face, into our faces. Can that actually change transportation? Can that change the future of transportation moving on? So that's just one thing I would like to, to just throw in the conversation. I don't know, but yes, who knows what will happen in 50 years time. 
So yeah, lots to, to get into there as to whether whether the meta tag will disappear, whether we will end up in the matrix or not. Um, I guess compared to 50 years ago, we're quite close today having this conversation. Um, a few more steps, uh, and we might be joining Jenny in a conference mezzanine uh, virtually to carry on our conversation and all of our audience would be in the room next door uh, and we'd all feel, <laughs> feel very together. Um, I, I'm reminded over that, and I'm not sure it's even an intergenerational thing, but increasingly anxious about the carbon footprint of what we're doing right now. Um, and every time we press a button and the, the metaverse whirs behind us, um, how much energy and in turn potentially emissions are being created. So there's a there's a difficult question, I think, as to whether or not there's an alternative to transport that truly is going to diminish the um, pressures we're putting on the environmental system. Thanks for that. Uh, let's come to Christine. What caught your attention, Christine, in the questions? So um, I've been thinking about what inspires me when looking to older or younger peers for insight. Um, and I think what really inspires me is the opportunities for intergenerational collaboration um, and what we can gain from that. You know, we know that we can benefit from a diversity of perspectives, experiences and ideas um, and, you know, bring in older and younger peers together. You can comp combine the wisdom of the past with fresh ideas for the future. Um, which ultimately means better decision making when it comes to tackling complex challenges. Um, I think, you know, if I think about my younger colleagues, they bring, you know, some really fresh new perspectives, thoughts on innovation, how to use um, different tech that perhaps I'm not familiar with. Um, and certainly some of my older colleagues wouldn't be. They have a real drive for change and impact. Um, so they want to make positive change, make meaning impact for communities and for the world as a whole. And they're so passionate and energized and committed to both social and environmental causes. Um, so it really inspires me. And I think it can inspire other generations to reevaluate their own approach. Um, and then when I think about older peers, um, you know, that's about what can be gained from their experience and wisdom um their knowledge of the system you know if something might be a bit tricky to navigate someone who's you know been immersed in that for longer can have some good ideas about how to um how to get through some of the obstacles um they might have advice on you know what what might get approval what wouldn't how to you know tweak it to get things through that sort of thing so you know they have um a lot of of uh, organizational experience. Um, then you might know the historical context, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, yeah, we've been here before, that didn't work, you know, or it didn't work in this form. So, you know, how could we think about it differently? Um, they might have some insight on potential consequences and implications of certain actions or decisions. And then of course the mentorship is so crucial, isn't it? Um, you know, what we can gain from our older, more experienced colleagues um, that can help us be more effective practitioners um, now um, and in the future. But then again, I think we need to look, you know, beyond our peers as well and look into communities um, and gather those perspectives. You know, I one of the things I love the most about our work is the way we co-design with the children, at, you know, in school, wide range of different ages, um, maybe taking them out into the community to get a feel for how they experience the place, um, you know, what they recognise as the dangers, what makes them feel safe, all that sort of thing. I think that's really exciting. And I think, you know, making sure that we are really effectively um, working with a wide range of different individuals um, to plan our spaces um, and make them um, healthy and safe for everybody. Thanks, Christine. Um, as you're talking, I was thinking about reverse mentoring um, and, and actually also reminded about my daughter, Rosie, um, I, whether you're, you're guilty of this sometimes with your family members, but the difference between um, hearing and listening. Um, and when I really listened to Rosie, I realised 
how much wisdom she has on those little shoulders. Um, but it's very easy to slip into just hearing when you're busy and preoccupied with your own sort of importance and set of commitments. So once we've we've heard from Jenny uh, and Mark, uh, just leave a question with you all. Um, have Can you recall an experience of reverse mentoring, which in, in a sense is where someone, uh, if you're the um, if you're the mentee, you're receiving uh, advice from someone younger than you. Uh, if you're the mentor, you're giving advice to someone older than you. And I wonder if you do, if anything comes to mind for each of you, about something that's really stayed with you when you've had that experience um, and opportunity. But before we do that, and Jenny, you're still with us, which is wonderful. What, what caught your attention in those questions that we set up for the event? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Glenn. Uh, I want to start by remarking on something that Janice said, because it's a, it's a perfect illustration of, of the point I was trying to make about, you know, not just continuously learn, but try to remember what you've learned. Uh, the, the massive transport changes we achieved during COVID, which really were quite remarkable. We, I can't remember whether we know through leaks or whether we know through official channels, but we do know that while the scientists were urging the government that lockdown was the way to go, uh, ministers were reluctant because they, some of them feared that the citizens just wouldn't obey and that once citizens had worked out that you could not obey one regulation, then maybe mass dis civil disobedience would follow. And it turns out that, of course, we were actually very obedient. But that's, that's no surprise to anyone who tries to keep in her head the lessons who, which have been learned. Uh, the, the London Olympics 2012, TfL did such a fantastic job on indoctrinating us that we, we, we in London changed our, our travel habits completely. Not just our, our travel habits, we ordered, if we were in the, 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 the types of businesses that order goods, we were changing our goods deliveries, we were holding more stock than we normally would be, we were making new arrangements for perishable stock. We, everything was just turned upside down and people just did it. So how did we not remember in early 2020 that, oh, actually, this is how citizens react. So a really good example right there. Uh, I, I was, otherwise I was caught by the question about, uh, it, it was slightly finger pointing the, the slant of it. It was which of the transport professions is the one that really needs to get itself organized in order to deal better with the future. Um, and I, I would riff on that and say that I don't, I wouldn't single out any of the different professions or specialisms. I think all of us uh, need to change the way we are, all of us in, in professions. And again, I would go a little bit back in history and say that up until, but certainly through the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance, if you did what we now would call a professional job, you were really expected to be quite across the piece, like alchemists, people trying to turn base matter into gold, also needed to have a good grasp of astrology and a good grasp of divinity because both those things were thought to play into this making of gold. If you were what we would now call an architect and it was your job to uh, get a cathedral built, not only would you do what we would now call the architectural part of the job, you'd be the quantity surveyor, uh, you'd be, be the, the person who understands how, how good foundations are built on different types of, of ground. But you would also be expected to know how, how do certain types of marble look when light shines on them from certain perspectives, what we would now call design. You, you were expected to know all that. And then as we get towards, uh, I suppose, the end of the, of the 17th century, the professions start to form as we have them now, which is that you're a doctor and, or you're a lawyer or you are, going back, an architect. And it's actually laudable. The more narrow and deep you are, the better you are considered to be. And, and that's, I think, still what we have with us now, that you are better uh, the more super specialized you are. And this is not at all, uh, I'm not trotting out the anti-work trope of or experts who needs them. You know, don't listen to it, experts with qualifications. Listen to your son-in-law or some random bloke on Twitter. That's not at all what I'm saying. What, what I think all the transport professions need to do now is be more medieval if I can say that be more in tune about with be more in tune with what goes on around you in all the adjacent professions I used to think that it was enough just to have multidisciplinary teams 
or maybe to have a generalist in charge of the team. I used to think that was enough, but I don't so think so anymore. I think each individual needs to be a specialist, absolutely, in their chosen topic, but also pride themselves and consider themselves to be a better professional the more understanding they have of all the adjacent topics, which could be transport planning, could be human behavior, could be IT, depending on where they sit themselves. So that, that's, I've slightly twisted the question, which I hope, I hope is okay, because I think that, that point is, if I make one point today, that's the point I want to make. Yeah, I've written down uh, up the generalists, um, as well as be more medieval, which I think is a, a lovely challenge. It might at least get the attention in the, uh, the social media swirl of transport exchanges going on at the moment. Um, Mark, let's come to you now. What did you make of the questions on offer at the beginning? I found the frustrations was the good question. Um, and there were two areas. The first one were the long, long, long lags in the, in the ideas and issues being taken up. And I'll just give some examples. Simulation and validation of models. 50 years between when I published and now it's still being cited. Accessibility and now a crucial measure. 43 years. Parking and environmental impact measures. Two separate things. 41 years. Family expenditure and time use budgeting. 39. Bicycles and equity in road pricing impacts. 36. Artificial intelligence, expert systems and neural nets, 35. Legal and planning applications of expert systems, 33. You can check yourselves. I just looked at Google Scholar to see the differences. Now, those lags are too long. I don't know quite how we improve them, but I think we need to actually work better on making certain that ideas are propagated and communicated. However, Generally, conferences and places like that work rather better than Zoom does. So I think we have to remember that as well. But looking forward, the seeds that have been sown that have not flowered yet is and not widely integrated is ethics. Ethics in transport apply in a number of different ways. And really, I only know of a couple of decent books on the subject. And it's really important. Um, Another one, the slow, slow penetration of, shall we say, major project analysis into transport, which is actually subject to an awful lot of large scale expenditures. I think most of us, well, we may or may not know about Blank Figberg, who's a professor at Oxford who looks at this stuff. Well, one of his most useful findings is that for political reasons, most mega projects are under budgeted by approximately 30% on political grounds. Things like this can be drawn from other fields simply by greater interaction. And that particular one is really, really useful. There are many other points I made in my opening comments, but the one I'd really like to emphasize, and I'm delighted that Jenny did it for me, is transdisciplinarity matters. You don't just dump six different little pegs of different disciplines into a room and have a manager. You need to have the cultures collide. It's when that happens, creativity occurs and change happens. I'm at, I've been writing some papers on it lately. But that's another way of engaging more effectively. And I'm frustrated that we're not picking up these human resources or organizational psychology, whatever you want to call it, these ways of actually helping people adapt and expand and innovate. And I think that's something that really matters. And we've got to make it a target because we don't have a lot of time. None of us have emphasized how quickly the external changes are occurring, but we all know it. That's why I concentrated solely on improving the rates of change and innovation take up. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, well, I know correlation and causation are not the same things, but I wonder whether the fact that people are still citing some of your papers from many years ago does reflect that there's some, at least an attempt to pick up Jenny's point, to remember what we've learned 
um, from, from the past and, and prior research. Um, I've also written down, prompted by a comment in the audience from Dirk de Priest, um, polymathematics. I don't know whether that's a phrase, um, but I wonder whether we need to introduce polymathematics into the transport profession. In other words, uh, really embracing well, what both you and Jenny have said, that you know, we, can't, we can't just be experts. Uh, we have to be generalists as well. It has to be within our DNA to be, if you like, multilingual uh, in making sense of the diversity of issues around us. Um, well, as ever, at least from my point of view, time has flown as we've gone through um, addressing this topic. So what I'd like to do is go around each of you one last time, um, partly to return to that question I asked about reverse mentoring, um, either if you have a view about it or if you have a specific example which might illuminate things for others, um, but then also your sort of closing takeaway or message to the audience about the importance of intergenerationality um, in the way we deal with looking at the future of transport. Uh, so I'll just check first of all, before I pick someone, is anyone feeling primed and ready to say, I'll go first? Uh, yeah, I, I can do, because I've got my example lined up. Go, go, go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, I can almost see the whites of all your eyes, um, even though we're in the metaverse, Emmanuel. But uh, Jenny, over to you. Yeah, so I have I have an example which isn't transport related uh, particularly, but I think it's a good example. And and my my mentor, who very much younger than me, uh, is somebody I met through transport at least. So we were both working in transport. But what what she taught me was uh, uh, she taught me two things. First of all, she herself is uh, British Zimbabwean, and she's from an extremely wealthy, well connected Zimbabwean family. She's I'm not entirely sure if Zimbabwe has a class system, but if it does, then she's up a class. And she taught me two things. She taught me, first of all, how hard it is to be an upper class African person in England because of all the assumptions that the native English people put up on you when they see you. And that taught me a lot. And I've carried that over into all sorts of other situations. And yeah, but that was a really useful learning for me. And the second thing she taught me, uh, her, her degree, even though she was working in transport at that time, her degree is in uh, international development. And she said to me, we don't want aid. We don't want assistance. We don't want people coming, working with us for a year and then going again. We just want you to, to trade with us the way you trade with everybody else. And I thought, wow. So neither of those two are transport learnings, but they didn't half help me grow as a person. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. Mark, are you lined up happy to go next? Yes. I have to say, quite honestly, I don't pay attention to age at all. I've learned from every age. I think that must have been apparent from my earlier comments uh, about children and adults. You've got to remember that I'm so old that I'm 20 years older than Jenny and I can remember the Second World War. Now, how much adaptation is that required? And what are the differences between children of that era and children of this era? And I think that's a really interesting question because our environments have a big effect and we do have a lot to learn from the way children are actually marshalling concerns. I'm hearing from more and more children or what I regard as children in their early 20s deciding not to have children in the environmental uh, forecasts that they can see and the levels of instability. There are major shifts in perception and behaviour that we can learn from if we listen to them and I'm actually finding it fascinating listening. Thanks Marcus. No, I'm really inspired by what you said there. Um, and certainly it reminds me of conversations I find myself quite often having about the formative effects of childhood uh, and indeed adolescence coming to um, Sarah and Kieran's work. And, and of course, as Jenny's highlighted, going on through our lives, you know, there, there are formative um, encounters that we have that can really put strong imprints on us. But, you know, surely we ignore particularly younger generations at our peril. Um, right, where should we go next? Would, would someone else like to step forward or I'll... I'll pick someone. Um, Come in, Glenn. Okay, Christine, thank you. 
Um, so in terms of an experience of reverse mentoring, I'm sure there are lots of examples. Um, so, yeah, I've been sort of, you know, trying to think through my career for the best one. Um, and I'm going to go with actually rather than, um, you know, something that's happened with a colleague. Um, I'm going to go with an example from just a few weeks ago where um, we had an event which was celebrating 10 years of the Active Travel Act in Wales. Um, and we had um, some children from one of the schools that we're working with um, that were there. And uh, one of the, um, the children that joined us was um, he, he spoke and just reminded us all of um, the importance of connection in active travel, which I think was a really um, powerful and important point that, you know, there are lots of people to, in today's society that are very lonely and um, traveling actively in your community allows you to connect with other people, um, you know, in a way that you never have with a car. And I think you can probably take that point to um, public transport as well, can't you? You know, you very much connecting with other people um, when you're traveling um, on foot, by bike, or on public transport. Um, and so, um, you know, that is the thing that I took from that conversation and have kept with me and want to share with everyone today. Um, and then I think in terms of final thoughts, um, just around making the point that, you know, what, what Sustrans is trying to do is um, support people to travel in a healthy way. There are many health and well-being benefits from active travel, um, as well as well-being benefits for the environment and the planet, which are very important. Um, so, yeah, to kind of, you know, push active travel in particular and then a final point on climate change um, our research uh, showed from a year or two ago that there's around about 70 percent possibly a bit more of children think that adults are not doing enough to tackle climate change so let's you know go away from this event and make sure that we are doing as much as we possibly can Thanks, Christine. Again, yeah, more, more powerful points there. And I will certainly go back and sense check with Rosie whether she's in that 70% or not, or whether indeed her dad's in the uh, category of adults who aren't doing enough. Um, Emmanuel, should we come to you? And then Janice. Um, yes. OK, thank you. I guess mine is just to recognise my children in terms of perhaps the way they, when I say mentor, but, as in, but just the way they challenge me, when it comes to my own desires to be to be comfortable and drive to school. Yes, I guess that's something, I think at that age, they are beginning to recognize that we could do something different. And I guess that's something I'm trying to also recognize saying, okay, if you like to do these things, then I might as well support you. So again, getting together to cycle to school. So that is something I feel it's important to, to always recognize. So why recognizing this uh, generation, but also to know that the children can also motivate us to do what is right. And that aligns well with what Rosie was saying in terms of, okay, what will life be in 50 years time when we are all gone? What will they be saying about us? Like, yes, those are the guys that, that drove all the vehicles and destroyed the planet for us. So I think in terms of mentor, I guess for me, it's just to recognize that the children are watching and also they need that kind of encouragement as well to say, I'm not too tired to cycle to school today. Guys, let's go. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Yeah, and this issue of 50 years um, or 60 years or 70 years, you know, I'm imagining Rosie on a panel, um, perhaps, in, in a situation like Marcus looking back on many illustrious achievements, um, but she will perhaps be getting close to the year 2100, which seems so far away we needn't bother about it. And yet it's very real for um, many of the young people today. Janice. Um, not sure if I, ha I can think of anything in terms of reverse mentoring, but I think my takeaway from this is, I mean, I've been very, um, I've, I've loved the discussions I've been hearing from Jenny and Marcus. And it's just, uh, I was just wondering, is there something as a transport planner's handbook we could somehow <laughs> create where we just collate all these, you know, advices that we have? Because, um, you know, there's so much to learn from the different ways things have happened in the past. And, um, you know, who knows, history can repeat itself. So that's something definitely that we could, as young professionals apply um so yeah <laughs> it'd be so cool if we could do that <laughs> i love that idea yeah thanks 
So just before I hand back to Brogan, uh, we're almost at the hour. Um, first of all, a big thank you to our panel and to everyone in the audience who's joined. Um, rather nicely, from my point of view, our centre at UWE, the Centre for Transport and Society, um, is at its 20-year mark um, as a research centre. Uh, and we're called Transport and Society. And what I've heard loud and clear today from all of you is that and society absolutely matters. Um, and that means we need to look outside transport as well as look across the generations. Uh, after all, travel is a derived demand. Um, and in fact, when we look at people's needs and desires, they want boring things. They don't necessarily want shiny, sellable things which might make Britain great again um, and carve out a new economic powerhouse for us. Um, but will leave people wanting in their daily lives and through their life course. Um, so let's, as Jenny says, consider being more medieval. Uh, and maybe we can have a medieval handbook uh, put together over the months ahead. So thanks ever so much, everyone. Brogan, back to you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hopefully we'll see you later this month at TPM and definitely at the next PTRC Fireside Chat. Thanks. <laughs>